I say this to people all the time and they think I'm joking. The best place to be a black person in the world is America. And you see how that is. It's not like, oh, it's peaches and roses, but this is the black, the best place to be a black person in the world. And so that should let you know about some of these people and where they're coming from, right? It's like being surprised that a young African that doesn't know about slavery is accepting, is thinking the African educational system is there to educate the African. It's like, no, sir. Welcome to the Networking with Michelle podcast, the show dedicated to providing you with life strategies with a little bit of entrepreneur advice. Here we believe in the Jim Rohn quote, success is nothing more than a few simple disciplines practiced every day. Hey everyone, welcome to the Networking with Michelle show. I'm your host, Michelle Gomez, and we are on episode 10, Perspective of Black Lives. Woo! It's been a journey. It's been a journey. I think I have some more in the bag, though. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. But today, look, I am amped about this interview, this conversation. And this is a brother who I've actually been admiring online. A few, hopefully you're familiar with the show called The Great Vine. It comes on YouTube and have, I guess, Black Millennials. I feel like as I get older, am I still a millennial? Um, but we have black millennials uh, that are, you know, at the round table having conversations, you know, t- and it's good to hear everyone's perspective, background, expertise on some of those topics. And I remember this brother came through like a force, just spitting out knowledge and facts. And it's like, yes, okay, I'm here for it. And then I found out he's from Cameroon. Huh. Yes, 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 yes. Cameroon, stand up. Yes. So, you know, just admiring the show, his work, following him. We connected on Instagram and probably for over a year now. And then I was thinking about my podcast and I remember this vividly. I was pulling up to Walgreens, stepped out of my car, opened up Instagram and his story popped up. And I was like, Michelle, you got to hit him up. You got to hit him up. And um, like that, we connected and here we are. So in this episode, we are going to talk about just the issues between Africans and African-Americans, right? And this conversation takes you all over the place. That's all I'm going to say. Like, it takes you all over the place. So brace yourself. Um, Manny Blacks is a real one. I hope you enjoy it. Let me know. Let me know. I'm excited about this one, y'all. All right, everyone. Um, thank you so much. So excited about this episode. Have my new friend on the show, Wilson. Wilson, welcome. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. How are you doing, sis? I'm good. So why don't you tell the people a little bit about yourself? Okay. Um, my name is Wilson. Wilson Blacks. Please don't forget the S. I rep that Mundon Yaoundé city, that east side Yaoundé thing. Shout out to the brothers that died. Shout out to the sister that died. Shout out to the ancestor. Shout out to those coming. Shout out to those living. May peace and happiness find you wherever you're standing. You know what is the energy and vibe for 2020? Yeah, see that right there? Like, this is why I like, oh, no. So y'all already know. Because <laughs> yes, yes. it feels good to have that male energy, right? So mm-hmm. I think a lot, first of all, I just love intelligent conversation. Mm-hmm. And I know this is our first time talking, but I'm always in awe when I can hear that from a man and then when that can be matched in my presence Mm -hmm. that's greatness right now so where do you where did your intellect come from um i think so like my mom and my dad are both like (laughs) they're both intellectuals in there so my mom's my dad's nickname for my mother is from a Balzac book. It's the name of a Balzac book, Bellamy. And it's a story in between two men who are great friends. It's like, it's like my beautiful friend. So the story is originally about like a man and a man, but in his case, he adapted it to my mother, right? So when, when you be like, when, when people's love stories has got like French literature subtexts, you're bound to just be a geeky brother. You know what I'm saying? So like, my intellect, I think, first and foremost, comes from them both. My mom and my dad. Their their pursuit of intellect is 
it's different, but it's it's similar in the sense like they both study social science, and like they're both sharp people. They're both sharp people, and they're not people who know how to be quiet, right? Some people are intelligent, but they're quiet with their intelligence. They're the type of people who are bold in their movements and their modes of operation. So they kind of just, they didn't really leave me much of a choice, right? Like, it was one of them situations, like my mom, like when I was a child to work as a journalist, we used to talk about like geopolitics at my dinner table, right? That's just what was going on. Like, you know, but yeah, that's that's where that comes from. So do you feel like you always had that or was this something you stepped into? Because I tell my, like, I didn't, realized my confidence until I was 32. I'll put it to you like this. Like, I had an opinion on the Israeli-Palestine conflict that was like 10 years old. You know, like, real life. I had like an opinion. Like, when the FLN were bombing in Algeria, I was a child in Africa watching those images, like, formulating. It's like, yo, so, what's the point of the national? How does that, how does that entity turn into a terrorist entity that's now bombing this country. And like this French man that's telling me this narrative, who is he, right? Like, I mean, the thing about growing up in like Cameroon, especially the time in Cameroon where I grew up in, it's like, we saw the devaluation, right? One day we woke up and everything doubled in prices. So whether or not you cared about the geopolitics, geopolitics cared about you, right? Because I mean, if, you, if you're living in a city where everything doubles in price overnight, you got to try to ask some type of answers because, you know, people think about it in the big sense. But like, if you're a little kid that goes to a corner store and at the corner store, a full baguette is sent, it's 50 francs CFA. And with 100 francs CFA, you're able to get a full baguette. And inside that baguette, you're able to get 25 francs worth of chocolate, 25 francs worth of, of butter. And then the next day, now you only have half the baguette, right? Because your 50 francs only buys you half the baguette now. What you doing, right? Like, how do you explain that as a child? Like, marbles, the price of our marbles doubled up. And it's not exactly like we were rich, right? So every little marble that we had mattered to us. And nobody could explain to us why the price of the marbles kind of doubled, you know? Like, I mean, it's just so, that's that's where it comes from for me naturally. I just, I came up in an environment where you had to know something because so much was happening how else are you going to explain yourself the world, right? Otherwise, you're just going to be living in confusion and chaos all the time. And, you know, your own day is good for the chaos. If you can minimize it, you try to go that route. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, at what age did you come to the U.S.? So I first came to America when I was um, 13. I left when I was 17. And then I came back when I was, like, 27. Wow. So, uh, so yeah, like... Okay. So, like, whilst I know America, like, I'm still a stranger in America, right? So, like, I did, like, my last year of middle school and my high school years in America. But then again, like, I went to military school in Chatham, Virginia. Like, I was, it was like, it was like, wow, like, America. Then I left, right? Because, you know, like, cause, like, we're talking Chatham, Virginia. We're talking, like, the deep south. Like, my first roommate calmly told me his grandfather was in the KKK. I'm looking at this shoot, like... Yo, big man, say, like, you know, but, you know, the, the advantage for me, like, part of the reason I ended up in military school is I came up, I came up, like, you know, in the lower socioeconomic background. And, you know, poor people resolve our issues with fists. And when I came to America, my class had updated. And so you're trying to take, like, the methods of the previous playground onto the new playground and then be like, no, no, on this playground here, we insult one another, sir. We don't fight one another, sir. That's not what we do, right? <laughs> and this is how I ended up in military school. So military school was a place where I was able to keep some of these playground rules, but it also created a shelter for me. For example, when I hear people describe their like American high school experience, like mine was like five hundred boys sitting somewhere like an hour from like Lynchburg, Virginia. Right, dealing with racial tensions. Nine, you know, say nine eleven happened while I was in high school. Like all of these type of things, but it's like a microcosm. And there's, you know, the adults are here, but they're not. It was, it was interesting. It was interesting. I liked it, but it's only when I got out of high school that I realized how sheltered I was. For example, there was the only girls in my high school were day students, so like I didn't have a girlfriend throughout high school. I wasn't talking to girls. Like I learned how to talk to girls in college. Mm -hmm. It's a bit, you know, all of these things. But, you know, I learned how to throw a good hook. So, you know, you gotta... <laughs> you went to college back home. No, so I went to college in Canada. 
And then, yeah, I went to college in Canada and then I went to the UK. Then after that, I was going to go home and I was going to, you know, I was going to save the country and all of that, right? So, boom. Yeah, of you know, like, I'm, I'm, going, I'm home and everything. And the man number like, yo, where's your money? And I'm looking at it like, what you mean? I got ideas, bro. I read all these books. Man, I'm like, yo, fam, we can't eat the books. <laughs> We can't eat the books. It's like, oh, that is cool, cuz, but we can't eat the books. And, you know, so I came back to America to try to, you know, catch a couple meals and, you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me catch some meals so we can join forces and save our country. Um. <laughs> <laughs> the more the merrier. We need all hands on deck. <laughs> we really do. Oh, my God. Um, God, there's just so much. So... And uh, just tell the people where you are now. I'm in the Washington, D.C. region. They call it the DMV for simplification. But, you know, I like to call it Freshies Paradise, right? If you're fresh off the boat, it's a good place to be fresh off the boat. I'll put it to you like this. You know what I'm saying? Like, shout out to... I mean, compared to, like, there's Mac Cameroons in places like Kansas now. Compared to, like, Kansas, A-OK. A-OK, right? Like, I... (laughs) okay even like texas like texas is real america my nigga out here it's like there's enough immigrants to where you could just like float you never really have to feel like you are in america right meaning like from the moment i'll tell you a simple story so there's a guy he won the green card lottery the people that were supposed to pick him up at the airport stopped answering his phone calls when he was in paris when he lands my uncle is there to pick up some lady he was living with sister or something like this. Whilst on the plane, this guy sees this lady. They get to talking. She explains to him what it is. So the lady's from Liberia. She, when she lands, she tells my uncle, oh, here's one of your Cameroonian brothers, right? His people aren't answering his phone. He's like, all right, cool, son. Come, say less. He drops off the lady, gets the guy to live with him, gets him a job. The guy then enlists in the, I think, National Guard or something. Now he's married, you know what I'm saying, with children. He met that lady in the airport and found a way at the, in the airplane and found a way at the airport. I'm not sure if you as a young African land in like Dallas, Texas tomorrow morning off the conversation on the airplane. I'm not sure it's going like that. It could. I don't live out there, so I don't know. But, and that's like an authentic DMV story. Like if you're an African, like, Fam, if you really want to feel like you're not in America, in the DMV, it's possible. They got the African spots. Like, I'm talking about, you know, when people grill inside of people's apartments and stuff like that, it gets like that sort of thing. And so I appreciate that because I don't think you could do that in a lot of places in America. I don't think a lot of places in America allow you to be different, to not be American, right? Like in the DMV, it's okay to not be American. Like you are in America, but it's okay to not be American. There's so many foreigners. There's so many. It's also because, like, the government workers, it's like a cyclical side. People don't stay here for their whole career. They come here, get a couple years for their resume, and then keep it pushing. So the place has enough transiency to where nothing feels rigid, right? And as an immigrant, those are the type of li- those are the type of settings that you want to enjoy in the in the Western world. Those places where the Western world is super rigid, you know, it gets complicated. I'll put it to you like that. I can see that. I can see that. So um, I'm in Houston and um, I say this all the time and I probably have some friends that are going to come for me, but Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Nigerians are taking over. So I'll take it over. No, no, no. Y'all are just sleeping there. With, yo, the Nigerians been coming to you. The Nigerians been about that oil money since the 70s. People were sleeping, but them Niger boys were serious about their hustle. People were sleeping. Them Niger boys have been in Texas. It's just you people that are discovering. <laughs> well, I went to high school in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. I went to okay. High school in Atlanta, Georgia, but I've been in Houston for 20 years. So this mm-hmm. is. But, um, yeah, so, you know, I've, I've been all over, right? Mm-hmm. But, um, and wherever I go, they're there, taking over. So I'm like, no, I'm you know? Listen, <laughs> no. Niger, no, they carry last. When they told you people that they met that, people thought they were playing, but they're not playing. When Nigerians tell you Niger, no, they carry last, they mean that. Like, they mean that. So I put it to you like this. Like, one of my friends broke it down to me like, like this. His name is Jeremy. He's like, in Nigerian society, in Cameroonian society, we drink our rage away. 
in Nigerian society, they hustle their rage away. Mm. You know? Like, them and they have to find, like, they're not going to sit, nah, 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 nah. I was born poor, I refused to die rich, and I will, anything, them and they will do anything that's necessary to accomplish that. In Cameroon, you know, we'll be like, we'll complain, and then we'll go to the bar, chill. Them Nigerian boys, we be chilling. <laughs> And that gym boys don't know nothing about chilling. They only want to chill in the worst words. I can't be mad at them. Did you see? There was a story that actually happened recently of two Nigerian uh, 419 guys. Mm -hmm. They hit up the U.S. government for $35 million for COVID ventilators. That's where I had to say, Niger, I know they carry last, boy. Like, come, like, come. You have to salute the audacity. You have to salute the audacity. Man hit a 35 mil lick on the U.S. government in the middle of a global crisis and pandemic. Hey, yo. And then that was in Dubai, stunting and brawling. Like, hey, yo, cuz. Oh, you you don't care. You're a real bad boy. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, my God. <laughs> no shame. No shame. No shame. At all. At all. Man was... Man, man was like, man was an Instagram celebrity off the fraud thing. How, bro? How? <laughs> oh, man. <Okay. laughs> but um, I think one of the, I like what you said, right? About which, where you live in DMV. Mm -hmm. And um, I had this conversation earlier, but I would definitely love your perspective as a man. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think are some of the differences, um, some of the issues, the conflicts, um, between Africans and African Americans that we're facing, or in just and as well as the diaspora as a whole. I mean, I think the biggest thing for me is I think we keep relying on a faulty translator. So boom, like me as an African, like I thought I understood the African American experience till one day I drove from DC to Louisiana and I stopped in Mississippi. So like now, boom. So that means you drove to Georgia, Alabama. Alabama was strange. Alabama, you a strange place, B. You a strange place. You need to talk to your peoples there. Your peoples there ain't know the 21st century. It happened, boy, but we just gonna leave that there. So I'm in Jackson, Mississippi. So now, shout out to Stamps Burger. Y'all got some ill burgers. If y'all still open, y'all got some ill burgers. It's like, it's the hood burger spot. They make like half a pound patties. It's by Jackson State. Fam, I walked in there. Shorty walked. I walked in there. Shorty walked in behind us. Her car had the AK bullets on it. It wasn't just one. She had niggas lit her whole shit up. I was like, oh, wow. Welcome to Ross Creek, Mississippi. So like Jackson, Mississippi was really fascinating to me because I'm driving down Medgar Everett Boulevard. So like as a foreigner, you hear the important names of the civil rights icons, right? And by important, I mean the ones that white people prop up, right? You don't hear about the snakes. You don't hear about the freedom busters. You don't hear about, like, the Fannie Lou Hamers of this world up until you start digging and scratching, you know? You don't hear about the Poor People's Coalition, none of these type of things. So I'm on Medgar. I'm on, I'm on this boulevard, and I'm with a friend of mine. She's African-American. She's from the Deep South. Her family now lives something like five miles from the plantation they were freed from, wow. right? So, you know, we talk, you know, because like, people, people forget. If you, unless you hear these type of things, you may not appreciate exactly what you're looking at. And so she's like, oh, that's Medgar's house. I'm like, who's Medgar? And she just stops and she looks at me. It's like, you don't know who Medgar is? I'm like, nah, sis. So she breaks it down to me. How on a Sunday morning, they shot that man that he stood on his door with his children inside of his house, mm -hmm. right? And that man wasn't one of the radical ones. All he wanted was to vote, you know? He said, yo, I'm an American. The social contract said, if I'm an American, I have rights. I would like some of my rights. He wasn't even on no brolic thing. He wasn't on no black supremacy. Woo, woo, woo. He was, I'm an NAACP organizer, and I want to give people the right to vote. I want to do voting registration. Man hit him with an elephant gun. Man hit him with an elephant gun. The bullet went through his, like, yo, fam. And so that, in that moment, you realize that, yo, fam, like, a lot of, the, a lot of these things that I take as granted were fought for. And I think sometimes that's what, Af what Africans fail to like. It's like, whoa, 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 bro. I hear that. I hear that. Just take a second to acknowledge that. But at the same time, I think sometimes African-Americans and others in the diaspora, because they haven't been back home and the only people that translate back home for them are either aid workers or aid brochures, they fail to realize what back home is, right? What I mean by that is like, 
Shadow slavery ended in the 1800s in America. If you think colonization is anything but shadow slavery, you read too many fantasy books. Forced labor ended in Cameroon, for example. The official date was 1905, but we were still forcefully conscribed to fight, to fight in both world wars. When the gold got kicked out of Europe, he landed in Douala, Cameroon, and rallied the troop all the way back up to the African continent. AK went around and conscribed children, men and adults, to go fight their war. We liberated Europe for both World War I and World War II, but we're not in history books. They made a parody for African soldiers and French soldiers that fought in great wars in 2007 after most of them had died. In some cases, the French state, after they helped liberate them, sent them back to their country and put them in concentration camp, as was the case in places like Senegal. So when people speak about colonization and they speak about modern African states, people have these like rosy images that are not based in our reality. I'm like, yo, bro, like, I hear that you're poor. Where I'm from... 400 CFAs is money, bro. 400 CFAs is about a dollar, right? It's about a dollar when you, you know what I'm saying? When you, that's money to get you killed, bro. Mm. Hear what I'm saying? Like, you think I'm joking. You think I'm exaggerating. You think I'm trying to be dramatic or speaking in hyperbole for the camera. It's like, no, 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 bro. Like, People are so desperate that for a sum that small. And the thing is, like, it's not like in the ghettos of America, people don't kill each other for $5. It's just like in America, the game is so slick that if you don't want to see American poverty, you never have to encounter it. American poverty is one, it's like America's little dirty secret. America likes to pretend like, oh, we don't, poor people, what are those? We don't have those. But 76% of Americans can't afford a $400 in emergency. So somebody's obviously lying, but that's another conversation. Back home, the poverty is so abject that you can't hide from it, right? And I think those are some of the... So, for example, when you're looking at that young Nigerian that's coming over at maybe 25, 26, you think, oh, he doesn't care about where he's just landed. But, bro, he's just escaped like a plantation, and he's traumatized. I'm not, I'm not excusing his silly-ass conservatism. I'm not excusing his silly ideas about African-Americans, right? I'm saying to you, bro, sit down talk to that person. Put that person on the game because that person needs game. To navigate what the first world is and what, like, the Western world is, they're going to need your help, right? Like, it's not one of these situations where we could afford to not look out for one another, right? But... The way the game is set up, the translator understands that if he translates our story accurately to either side, we'll see affinities. And us building affinities eliminates the job of the translator. You know what I'm saying? What do you say to those people? Because I think slavery is the biggest issue. It's like the underlying mm-hmm. issue, right? And I, my mom's 65 or almost 65. And I asked her, I was like, Mom, when did you learn about slavery? And she's like, I didn't know about slavery until I came to this country. Mm -hmm. 1980, 1981, right? And then I think about, not all, but there are some Black Americans that are like, well, the Africans sold us, right? And I think it's it's two different different stories, right? So I'll I'll say this. So like, there are slave camps 40 kilometers outside of my village, Hmm. right? So like... Aousa Fulani sold other black Africans. That's because Aousa Fulani feels superior to us. They still feel superior to us. If you go, if you go check the West Coast of Africa and you look at the core conflict and a lot of civil wars, the quote unquote tribalism is a continuation of the politics that allowed some people to sell other black people. So slavery is a contentious issue. But you, so for example, in the case of Cameroon, the official educational curriculum of Cameroon was written by the French Republic up until 1994. You think the French Republic is going to tell you an accurate recounting of slavery in the African colonies? That's, that's what you think is going to happen? So the thing is, like I said, be, listen, I say this to people all the time and they think I'm joking. The best place to be a black person in the world is America. And you see how that is. It's not like, oh, it's peaches and roses, but this is the black, the best place to be a black person in the world. And so that should let you know about some of these people and where they're coming from, right? It's like being surprised that a young African that doesn't know about slavery is accepted, is thinking the African educational system is there to educate the African. It's like, no, sir. That's real. That's real. So what about 
the other countries, right? Let's branch mm. off. We have the the islands, the Caribbeans, mm-hmm. West Indies, the Brazilians, yeah. second largest black population after Africa is in Brazil. Mm-hmm. The Europeans. Shout out to the Bonniers. Shout out to Paris. Boom, 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 boom. I mean, I think, I think this. I think blackness to me is like a Trojan horse, right? Because blackness was never defined by black people. It's not like black people got together and was like, oh, we are all black in this thing together. And let, no, that's not what happened. An outside factor said, oh, hmm, y'all look kind of similar. Boom, y'all are in a group now, right? So what happens a lot of time is inside of blackness, we are trying to fight for a space as if it's the totality, right? Like the experience, so for example, when we talk about the larger diaspora question, some people in the UK especially like to remind to our Jamaican brethren that, oh, you guys are African. And some Jamaican brethren look at them and say, like, we come from Africa, but we have our own thing. For me to try to reduce that person's experience to exactly mine is a foolish mistake. That's not what I want for black people. I want a world where every black person is able to define themselves in a way that's as complex as they want to be, right? So for example, the way in which a Northeast Washingtonian and a Southeast Washingtonian come across might be different. The way a North Londoner and a a South Londoner black in both cases come across might be different. I want to create a space where all those type of black people can exist, where a black trans person from Berlin and a black trans person from Brazil can find a space to coexist and be like, oh, there are similarities in our experiences, there are differences, there are specificity, come share with me, right? That's really what I think should be the ultimate goal of blackness. Like, too often people try to make it a restrictive definition, and I don't think it was meant for that. I agree with you. Do you think that can happen under the Black Lives Movement? I want to say yes, but I think, so... You see, like, the Dr. Umar Johnsons and the, like, um, Israelites of this world. A lot of people are dismissive of those people, but nobody ever asks themselves, why does it resonate, right? Why does it resonate? So, like, under the movement for black lives, for all black lives to matter, we need black people to buy into the notion that all black lives matter. Right? How do we make that happen? I think it could potentially happen under this current umbrella, but it's going to require some of us to do difficult heavy lifting. And you know, like people like to point like cis hetero black men as the ones that need to do the most lifting. It's like fair point. They do need to do some lifting. How do we provide the buy-in for them to do the lifting? Right? How do we involve them? Right? And the thing is, up until we, because the truth is. We can discuss the theory of how we get free all day. Sure. But the practical steps of black people getting free are unfortunately going to involve all of us. That means all the black folks you don't like are going to need to be free for you to be free. Right? So if you don't like the gays, well, guess what, bro? The gays are going to need to be free before you're free. You understand the ones there? If you don't like the straights, the straights are going to need to be free before, you understand? It's not, because that's the thing, it's not, like, people act like, oh, we get an option where we could just go kind of, like, check out a being black, right? It's like, oh, I'm kind of tired of my skin right now, so uh, what I'll do is, uh, what I'll do is uh, I'll calmly uh, just go trade it in, go to a store or something, you know what I'm saying? And like, these extra, wow, terrible. These extra black points that I have, I'll just trade them in. And it's like, that's not how this works, right? Just the way in which like, queer people are trying to make like, us straight people understand that my sexuality doesn't stop me from being black. I think it's high time all black people took a second to be like, okay, we are all black. We're all in this thing. And our freedom is linked. Once we are free, what we choose to do with our freedom is on to us. But we should, you know. <laughs> but I think the problem is we want to, and I can speak as a black woman, mm-hmm. have a conversation with other black women. I think we want to claim our intersectionality, but then when we have a conversation, it's not accepted. And then we don't hear enough men claiming their intersectionality as well. And I and I say this as a black person because I only know what we do within 
you know. I mean, I concur. And but the thing is, like, so for example, me, right? Like, I'm like an atheist, retired real Negro, nerdy sub-Saharan African, right? Those are some of my interse- Some of those are some of my intersection. Where is the space for me to express that, right? Because when people see me. People project onto me, right? The truth is, like, people talk about, like, black liberation all the time. And, you know, people talk about, like, the way in which black men hold it down or don't hold it down, or et cetera, et cetera. But, oh, my God. Yes, I often think that people are not ready my right now. to see Turn it back on. what about black about liberation microphone. might look like for some black men. For example, like, does black liberation mean that I no longer have to be a protector, right? Does it mean I no longer have to be a provider, yeah. right? If we're destroying the patriarchy, right? <laughs> okay, you don't have to do it, but I'm going to say the majority of women want those things. But that's the thing, though. If we are looking for liberation and destruction of all those systems, who are we going to be the day we destroy them? How do you define your manhood? I did the smart thing a long time ago and stopped allowing niggas that went inside of manhood to find my manhood. I define my manhood by the fact that I woke up this morning. Okay. You know? Like, that's the thing. I think too often, I used, like, that's it. Men, that's it. I woke up this morning. Me and my black ass manly self woke up this morning. <laughs> Therefore, a man woke up this morning. <laughs> and then, and then when, go, when a man goes to sleep at night, a man will go to sleep. That like, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm doing life wrong. Okay, go ahead. Cause like, I mean, because that's the thing, is like, especially like when you're a black man, they're so. So boom, like I'm six foot one, two hundred and something pounds, and people be like, "Oh, you say that all the time," but it's like, yo, that's because a lot of you people use people like me as cover, right? A lot of people don't got courage up until they come stand next to me, man or woman. I've seen it with my own two eyes. Well, it's just like, hold on, be you're a lot, you're a lot friendlier than this. Why is it not an outstanding here? You and all types of like, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, as a person upon, as a black body upon which people already project onto. I think the biggest thing you must do as a black man is to allow yourself to define your masculinity to yourself. I don't try that. to don't try to hold it to some because the thing is all these societal standards that people want you to hold up your masculinity to are rooted in things that are toxic and dangerous for those men. And I think so that's why it's re- because I also think part of the problem with black masculinity it's it's such high pressure and there's so little room to fail that black men become overcome with anxiety. And instead of doing anything, men operate from a place of fear and anxiety and then never manifest their potential. And big man, I'm not, I'm not living my life like that. Me personally. I, I can agree with that. I think I am fortunate to have some very intimate conversations with black men that I love and respect. And they have shared those things with me. Like more than one man on more than one occasion. Listen, I'm like, I had, so I ask a question to people sometimes and they think that I'm joking, but it's actually a question that sometimes they ask you, like, in therapy and these type of things, what's your favorite color? Right? So when you ask the question, people think you're just asking them a question. But really and truly, I want to find out whether or not you know yourself. Do you spend time enough enough time with yourself to have asked yourself what your favorite color is and come up with an answer that convinces you? People lack self-awareness. Right. Black men lack the most self-awareness, in my humble opinion. Mm-hmm. Right? It's like, yo, bro, read the room. Negroes refuse to steady read the room. What? No. Right? And it's just one of them situations where it's like, yo, bro, like, you've got to read the room. You know? Um, I don't think I don't think there's enough space, enough safe spaces for men. Um, and there there could be an increase in that. And I had a conversation with a friend on Friday, I believe. And I was like, hey, you know, you need a, not that he needs a therapist. He says mm-hmm. he wants a therapist. So therefore mm-hmm. I encourage him. And mm-hmm. I'm my journey with him 
plenty of times. I've shared my journey on the podcast. And I encouraged him to get a black male therapist. And he mm-hmm. was like, why? And I'm like, you need... Well, he disagreed, but I was like, there's just things that you go through as a man that a woman's not going to understand. Then if you have a if you have problems in your relationship with another woman, you have to be careful um, just, you know, sharing and processing and taking sides. And I'm sure women may come for me with that. But I was like, you know, there's there's things that a black man goes through that we just won't know and understand. So I was like, at least start I'm trying to get a black man as a therapist. Indeed. And I just want to speak to black men and remind them like smoking weed is not therapy. Drinking is not therapy. Playing 2K is not therapy, my bro. Like sex is not therapy. Right? Like, and you know, I, I mean, but it's like I said, like, I also have enough privilege as a black man to be able to say that, right? Like, I'm also tough enough to where I can afford to be vulnerable. Some brothers can't afford to show no vulnerability, right? Like, because that's like, for example, like, I used to think that was exaggerated, but like, I lost a lot of weight about like six years ago. I went all the way down to like 198, and it was the smallest I'd been in my adult life. And I was like, yo, people really treat you differently, right? I've gotten so accustomed of just being able to walk. I just walk and people move. But I don't have to move, big man. You move yourself. How you mean? I'm twice your size, bro. Move for my face. When I went back down to that, guys was like, no, bro. <laughs> like, I'm here now. <laughs> and, like, and so I was in that space temporarily. For the people, for the men especially who have to live in that space on the daily. I don't think it's as simple as a lot of people want to make it out to be. But at the same time, I don't want it to be like, oh, we need to coddle black males and et cetera, et cetera. I think this. I think as a black man, the unfortunate reality is like, my bro, you're going to have to save yourself, my bro. Yeah. Right? It's really one of It's like, yo, my bro, you're going to... And some of us are just not going to make it to that quote-unquote finish line. You know? like, And it's sad to say, but it's because... The game is changing so rapidly for black men, and I think a lot of us aren't properly peeping, right? So, for example, while, whilst I'm here, rest in peace, Oluwatoyin. Rest in power, sister. But events like these, like, that's a Ronnie King for some black women, right? The way in which Ronnie King was for some black men, what happened to that young sister down in Florida was a Ronnie King-like moment. Right. And in our case, it's a simple binary, bad white police officers. Mm-hmm. In the case of black women, it's like uh, a person that's supposed to protect me. Right. Right. And so black women are the type of people that are just going to sit and wait for your lack of solutions. Mm-hmm. It's just not a, it's not a luxury that they have. B, it's just not a habit that they're into. Right, they're going to find solutions for their lack of protection. We're not gonna like them solutions, right? But I think also, like, as black men, you know, because, like, if you don't want to save yourself, the game will go, type thing, right? I think a lot of us are just we, we are in a space where we are so fundamentally so unaware of ourselves, we're not even seeing the trends changing. Right. And I mean, I get it. Like I've been in survival mode and I understand that in the middle of survival mode, bro, <laughs> people talk about making year plan. I'm like, cause I'm not, I, I can't think out through the week. I can't tell you what's going to happen on Friday, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I understand the circumstances that brothers are standing in. I get it. But unfortunately, my brother, despite your circumstance, you are the only one that can save yourself. Right. Because the truth is black women have to save themselves. But, you know, everybody's a bad boy nowadays, so we shall see where it takes us. I mean, there's so much to unpack, right? The first thing I want to say is I also, like, we need to redefine all of these terms because, like you said, a lot of it of at least what is manhood is toxic, right? I, I do think there's layers to vulnerability, right? And I think lots of times men feel like they need to be, you know, head between the legs crying, and it's like, that's not always necessary, you know, depending on mm-hmm. nothing's wrong with that, but that's not always necessary. Right. And I really do believe a lot of it is just conversation, like fully expressing yourself in the moment. 
and men haven't had the space to do that. Like I said, like, I personally think people talk about this black liberation thing a lot, right? They love it. But I'm telling people, bro, if you really sit down and you think about what black liberation looks like for black men, I'm not sure you're for it, right? I'm not sure you're actually for liberation for black men, right? I think you're for liberation, but you've thought very specifically about what liberation means for you. But me as a cis old black man, I don't think people are ready for Because to me, liberation means like, yo, cuz, which I no longer have to try to uphold the patriarchy. I'm moving to the village, my bro. I'm growing cassava. Don't nobody talk to me, Reboy. boy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Don't nobody talk to me, Reboy. boy. Man, it's growing cassava and a little bit of, you know, on the side. And boom, I'm playing dominoes with the homeboys on the weekend. And from the rest of the time, I'm talking to my field. I'm not trying to talk to people. I'm talking to the forest, Reboy. boy. And what does that look like? What is an order, because like, yo, the thing is like, as a black man, bro, I've known so much strife. I've known so much like pressure. I've, I'm tired, bro. I am tired. I would like some peace, some solitude, and some separation okay. from the rest of people. Can, based off of your description, can, mm-hmm. a, can a black man be liberated and still contribute to society? Them Negroes might want to do that, but I'm not trying to do that. I'm not trying to think because yo, the thing is like the premise for me as a black man is false. It's a false premise because yo, I mean, think about it. Like I make this argument a lot, but people think I, you know, I'm saying it in jest, but I'm like, think about the emotional strain required to create a good soldier. Right? Like that man that laid on top of George Floyd was laying on top of a human being. And for two minutes and 56 something seconds of that was laying on top of an unconscious human being. You're a human being. You, you're not going to flinch when you feel a human being dive below you? <clears throat> Where's your mind at? What kind of emotional state are you in? for you to do that. You read the story of uh, Jordan Dunn in Florida. The guy shot him at a gas station, then went back to his hotel, watched movies, and drove home. Where's your head at? Where's your heart? Where's your empathy? Where's your humanity? So much of what we already are asking men to do is such an inhumane process that if liberation comes from me, I'm no longer participating in the dehumanization of myself. That doesn't make sense, right? Because from what I've seen, this is what women are saying. It's like, women are like, yo, bro, fuck all of that. Like, I'm trying to be a full-blown human, especially black women. They say, yo, there's days where I'm tough. There's days where I'm not. There's days where I need a hug. There's days where I need to march. And I want to be able to do all those things without fear for my life. And I look at them, sister, and I'm like, yo, sister, you right. I want the same shit. I want the same shit. But... The problem is, what does a society look like without gendered roles? I'm not sure a lot of us have have properly sat down and thought about that. Me personally, I'm not quite sure what it looks like, but I know that if liberation comes, my brother, I'm in the village with the cassava. The rest of whatever you may think you're doing is whatever you may think you're doing. But me, my brother, I'm going to be in the village with the cassava on a small hut. Like, big man with a machete and a whole, like, oh, <laughs> and a little boombox. Like, yeah, fam, we made it. Brother, we made it. You know, because you need, you need the truth. You need a little boombox because you still need some music. You know, like, you know, like, just because just cause we made it to liberation don't mean we got to, you know, like, I, I still want to be able to, you know, dance to a few songs. But what I mean by that is, like, liberation to me means peace and, sol- peace and solitude and solace away, a, a space to heal from the things that we have lived. And I'm not sure how we do that because the thing is like black men have so much to unlearn or have so much to unlearn. That's that's all people. You know, I had a conversation. I felt like, you know, once again, it was at the age of 32, I felt confident. Like I know some things, you know, got a little bravado about me. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I got that confidence, it's like, bitch, you got to (laughs) unlearn 31 years (laughs) stuff. You know, and and now at the age of 37, you know, I get compliments of like, Michelle, I admire you. You're so unapologetic. But I'm like, this is just within the past five years. Right. <laughs> right. 
Right. I mean, I think, I think about like, cause I, I really do think about it a lot because like as a young black man, like there's already, like I've lost so many of the men that I started this thing with, mm-hmm. right? Like so many, just like, and it's just like, yo, cause like, bro, like is old age possible for a Negro? Mm. Right? And like, not like one of those cool, distinguished Negroes that's, you know, never put a word above another, you know? Not nah, like for one of them loud, wrong, box, just like, yo, yeah, type Negroes. Is old age possible? Because, you know, I'd like to be one of them old Negroes, but I'm not sure. It's, you know, and so these are some of the things that I like, bro, like, man, some things, I don't know, man. Like, there's something that's been like, that's been like platinum on my mind. So as a result <clears throat> of um, the young lady in Florida dying, you know, people started to like lay out their emotions and like somebody referred to like black men as bullet bags, right? And so now like, I'm like, <laughs> you understand your pain. I can't center myself in the middle of your pain. Mm. But if that's how you see me, cuz, like what's the deal, cuz? You know, if if this is, and that's what I think some days get to be a bit like, okay, right? Like, it's it's really, it took me a long time to even be able, because like as a black man, it took me a long time to even realize it was okay for me to be selfish, to center myself. I didn't even know that was an option. Really? Fam, like, fam, like, if you go, like, that's what I'm saying, like, people look at the person back home who steals money and thinks he's the bad guy, but I'm like, the 150 people from his village who asked him for money, who are they, right? Like, that's the thing. It's like, black men live these, like, bro, like, half of these men that you're seeing performing are performing, right? The Negroes in the suits are performing. Mm. The Negroes on the corners are performing. And bro, like, I don't want to live my life performing to some of these ideals of what they feel I should be. That's dead, bro. That's dead. I want to live my life for me because I am worthy of my own life, if nothing else. I don't want dominion over your life. I don't want nothing to do. I would like to be, you know what I'm saying? But, bro, what does that look like? If you, like, if as black man as a whole, st- you know what I'm saying? Because, yo, bro, like, I keep looking, I keep looking. I'm like, yo, fam, like, bullet bags. That's what, you know what I'm saying? This is what, this is what, it's, it's hard and once again that's why I'm saying that's why I think black men need to talk and um, and women you know black women need to listen we need to hear this I think so obviously the conversation of protect black women right mm-hmm. and I feel that that is true mm-hmm. um, and I, I think there's also the wrong interpretation when it comes to protecting black women, right? And I think what hurts me the most about this recent situation is that once again, George Floyd has received a lot of attention about his death and he passed away after Breonna Taylor. Rest in peace, Breonna Taylor. Arrest the police officers who killed Breonna Taylor. Fired the DA. Abolished the whole police department, especially the narcotics unit, because they hit it with the no knock. Like, yo, fam, like, fam. Fam, the one hadn't been updated since January. And even if they say, cool, there was a drug operation going on in there. Where in America, there's a drug operation warrant the death penalty. Big man, I'm just... True, but those people, those drug dealers or whomever were already in custody. Right, right. You know, but let's say, okay, cool, there was oversight there. Where in America... Does a drug dealing operation warrant the debt penalty? Let's even give y'all the benefit of the doubt. Let's say, oh yeah, y'all didn't, okay, cool, where? And you see, the truth is, the sad truth about like Rihanna Taylor is if we don't keep the pressure, because they thought they had gotten away with it. The Louisville Police Department was like, 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 right? If we don't keep the pressure, because for George Floyd, you know, they arrested the officers, they fired them, but we've seen that with the Freddie Gray case. Mm We've seen where that, that, that movie can lead you. We've seen it for the Eric Garner case. We've seen where that song and dance can... In the Breonna Taylor's case, like, bro, they're on some shit where they're not even going to try to, like, give you the song and dance. Because the truth is, the, the messed up part is, people say George Floyd's death has changed the world, and I want to believe that. But part of me is like, are y'all giving us song and dance again? 
They are. Right? Because it's like the chokehold has been banned federally according to the new executive order unless the officer fears for his life. They're dangling. They're going to give right. us this moment, right? They're going to give us this moment and then shit, it's going to go back to normal. And we have to have the wherewithal to sustain this moment. Right. And unfortunately, we lost another life, in, you know, on Friday um, in Atlanta. And over the past two weeks, there's been at least five black people. Um, and here, and, here in Houston, and themselves? Here in Houston, one, he, they said he's a Hispanic guy, but whatever. Six people. That's not what we do. That's not what black people do. That's not what, what we do. What if I'm <laughs> themselves with a cell phone wire? That... I'll sway. That's not <laughs> that's not what we do. <laughs> in America, they didn't run out of guns in America. If we if you want to like not even to like not did they run out of guns in America? Like this bro, like what you see, that's what I'm saying. But to take it back to the case of Brianna Taylor, because yo, say her name. Mm-hmm. Say her name like for real, for real. Like Sandra Bland rest in power. Like Baby Amaya rest in power. Like, yo, I just found out that Baby Amaya, the one that died as a result of the flashbang, it was to shoot the first 48. She was on the first 48 episode. That's like, that's, that, that. come on, bro. Come on. Like, fam, men are dying for entertainment. You went in on a drug one, no knock, with flashbangs, in a house in America, big man. Like, what, what do you need flashbangs for? Is this for Lucha? Are you fighting the insurgency? Like, what are you, like, what are, what are, and people are going to tell you, well, the police officer might fear for his life, but I'm like, yo, cuz, there's 200 of you for every one guy, you have bulletproof vest, and my guy, you keep talking to me like you're a gangster. Well, bro, gangsters get shot some days, bro. That's what happens in the life of a gangster. So you keep talking to me about blue lives matter, and I'm a gangster, and I'm a tough guy. Well, real tough guy, part of what you signed up for was the chance that you might get shot. Tough guy, welcome to your job, bro. Like, I, I just, and the thing is that in the case of Breonna Taylor, she was the perfect victim. It's not like, oh, woo, woo, woo. You can't tell me she was on meth. You can't tell me she was a porn star. You can't tell me she robbed a pregnant lady and put a gun to it. You can't tell me none of these things. She was an EMT. She was one of them. She was one of them. Yeah, yeah. She was part of the LEO family, as y'all like to call it, the law enforcement family. Mm-hmm. Where, where's the support? Where's the unions yeah. calling for an investigation? But even if she, even if she was those things, she was at home. She was sleep. At home. Sleep in Kentucky because you're gonna say to me, "Oh, her boyfriend should not bust a shot." I'm like, "Well, maybe people in Kentucky should make guns a little harder to get, so that not everybody's armed, so that when you run through a person's door, people don't just get to shoot." Hmm, maybe. Oh no, but the Second Amendment. Okay, so where's your where's your well organized militia, bro? You know, it don't it don't apply to us. You don't the NRA ain't stand up. <laughs> right, 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 right. Where was Sean Hannity with the special on Breonna Taylor's boyfriend being just unjustly accused? Where was Tucker Carlson? I mean, he was one of the good guys with guns, no? Mm-hmm. Right. No, right. That, that doesn't apply to us, you know. And that's like that's a whole nother issue because regardless of who's going to be president, that entity is so stacked. Like, they're protected. Listen, I've been reading, like, on my slightly nerd thing, I've been reading Supreme Court decisions as of late, because, you know, mm-hmm. bro, what the Republicans did, you know, this guy Mitch McConnell, this guy Mitch McConnell's gangsters untouchable. Bro, because even if we have the next five presidents that are Democrats, what they've done with the judiciary in America is allowed them to, bro, Bro, the Supreme Court said gerrymandering was a partisan issue, but that the Justice Department shouldn't get involved in it. What? Uh oh. There are laws on the book that are literally racist, and guys are kind of like, hmm, you know, Kanye shrugging it. Bro, like, and the thing is, it was Trump who got these people in, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that guy's gonna go down in history, and he's a mediocre president. Yeah. He's a mediocre president, but the, the Republicans gave him enough of an alley hoop to where when he retired, he might look like a Hall of Famer. Because the Republicans are loyal to their party. 
not to the person. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't think they're loyal to the party. The Republicans are loyal to their cause. The party is just an excuse to their cause, okay. right? Like, people see the party and they think it's like, yo, because these are the same... All right, so boom, Trump has blown up the deficit. Remember the Republicans of, like, eight years ago, which the deficit was a big deal? They used to say, oh, my God, we will shut down... These people shut down the government twice over not trying to raise the deficit. My man wrote the deficit by, like, six, seven trillion in the past three months alone. I have not heard not one Republican come out and say nothing. Bro, the federal government, the Federal Reserve is now buying individual bonds. Republicans should be in arms right now. The White House should be under siege right now from supposedly fiscally conservative Republicans. I ain't here to peep. I would say we would collapse. Ideally, we should collapse. I'll leave it at that. Ideally, we should collapse. <sighs> Right. And so my whole thing about it is just like when you go back to like, once again, say her name, but the multiple ways and because the fastest rising prison population is black women. Right. Black women are breadwinners. And I think 40 percent or 60 percent of black households. Right. So it's like if you look at it, they're, they're criminalizing black household leaders. Right. Because that's the next step. And I think we as black men. If you're going to ride for George Floyd, burn some shit for Breonna Taylor, too. Right. That's all I ask. You know? And if you're not, at least be gangster enough to stand on that. Right? Look at these black women in their face. Don't gaslight them. Right? And like we were saying earlier, express yourself, black man, mm -hmm. so that these women can make a decision about where they stand. Right? Don't let your indifference be the thing that speaks for you. And too often, that's what we're doing. Like, you know, like, fam, like, but then at the same time, at the same time, I'm going to say something that's controversial. I don't think a lot of black lives, I don't think a lot of black men care about black lives. What do they care about? I don't think they care about very much. I mean, I think a lot of us don't even care about ourselves, to be honest with you, right? I think a lot of us are like on suicide mission, but too cowardly to kill ourselves. Mm. You know, like, because I mean, when you look at some of like the reckless behavior some men engage in, it's just like, cuz, are you sure you want to live? You don't strike me as a nigga who wants to live. You're right. <laughs> you know, like, when you break it down like that, you're right. And I think that's the thing. I think a lot of people who aren't in the circle underestimate the amount of dis despair that's going on inside of a lot of young black men. And I think that's where the conversations go wrong because you can't understand somebody if you can't understand the circumstances and the condition. It's like, yo, bro, a lot of brothers, man, bro, like, because even like, for example, there was a, there's a video that came out of a guy throwing a guy, of a young lady in a dumpster, a group of them, right? When you go on the man's Instagram page, you're like, my bro, are you telling the whole world how you get money? I swear how you get money is illegal, bro. So what's going on? Do you care about yourself? Are you sure? Right? Because, I mean, it's just, I think personally, I hate to be that guy, but we need healing of some form. I don't know if it's Jesus, Allah, Buddha, whatever, but we need healing because it's not sustainable. Right? One day, we will really be left by ourselves. Like, one day, black women are really going to hit the, yo, bro, I tried. I hit stage left. And on that day, man. So what I tell people, like, black women need to be protected. And I say, this is, you know, from the boardroom to the streets. Meaning, you know, if you work in corporate America and you believe the sisters qualify for this open role, say her name. Nominate her. Sponsor her. Um, because there's just a lot of reasons as why that should happen, right? Um, and then we can fast forward to something such as, you know, very recent um, with this young lady. And I feel for her because I'm like, she was at a protest. And I think this is where the conflict comes, where we're protesting and you would think if we're in this together, I should be safe with you in this moment. Um, but unfortunately, other intentions transpired. And even when she tweeted what was going on with her, no one came to her rescue. And mm. I'm not saying a man should have came to her rescue, but people... Yeah, no. Nah, people. Yeah. I, I think we use a lot of big words nowadays that we don't have real meanings for. Mm. Community is one of them. Mm -hmm. mm. Like, a lot of us talk about the community, being in community and et cetera, but 
the application of those things in our everyday lives are just not the greatest. And I think a lot of us really have to sit down and look at that because it's like, yo, bro, like, what are we doing? What are we doing? Sis was 19. It's like, what, bro? Like, what? Like, and nothing I can say is going to make black women feel safe. I can put in a plan of action, but even it might already be late for another sister by the time my plan of action comes into action, right? Like that, you know what I'm saying? And that's, I think, where a lot of us are missing. I think a lot of us are not properly like looking at the scope of it. We all think we're the good man. Every man thinks he's a good man. Right. Every man thinks, oh, I'm a good man, my friends are good men, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's like, yo, if you and all your friends do scamming, for example, <laughs> what's the measurement of good right and the thing is I'm not knocking your hustle I'm just at, you know saying like can you look at yourself and say maybe I'm not a good person that could be better but to take it back to the topic like I'm wondering though like especially in the case of the young lady in Florida it goes it goes back to that original conversation so here goes a young Nigerian girl who died in Florida after protesting for Black Lives in America, right? What's her, what are her intersections, right? Who who was she? Where was she going? And et cetera, and et cetera, and et cetera, right? Because I think too often when we talk about these conversations between African Americans and Africans, continental Africans, we we go for the big extremes, right? We go for the fresh off the boat Nigerian person who, you know, saying says some super wild thing or vice versa. But it's like an example like this young lady, where's the gap? Right. It's only going to be more migration, right? And it's only going to be like more generations. Are we going to find a way to coincide and coexist? Or, you know what I'm saying? Because the truth is, I often ask myself this question. I wonder which language they spoke at the bottom of slave ships. Because what it is, is I listen to them. Um, so if you're ever bored and you say you love black people and you're interested in black people, uh, the U.S. Congress Library has recordings of black people right in the antebellum time. Listen to them things. And understand, A, where we have come from, and B, why we must keep going. Because when you listen to them things, and you're like, yo, fam, they try to literally beat the humanity out of you. You know, like they, like they sound like human beings and just uh, so yeah. Seeing things like that make me realize that the gaps in our minds are often just there because in the eyes of those who look at us, we're all the same. Um, how do you think the migration is changing African society? I'll put it to you like this. So when I was a child in Cameroon, TV started at 5 p.m and it ended at midnight. Now we have, I think, 194 channels. Due to what's happened, et cetera, et cetera, everything that happens here happens back home. Mm-hmm. It's, put it like this. It's changed our societies in such drastic ways, I lack the words to express it. You know, that like, everybody from back home wants to come here. Mm-hmm. And everybody that's here, try to, try to go home. You know, and... I think the real problem is this place that we call home doesn't exist anymore. Mm-hmm. And this right here that they want to come to doesn't exist neither. Mm. You know? So as Africans, we really need to start to have more open and honest conversations with one another. You know, because we like to make fun of African Americans, but their identity might be the future of all African identities. Then we shall see. What I mean by that is that, oh, I can't tell you my village, that's coming for a lot of us, right? Like, how many of us live here can't speak our tribal languages, right? How many of us live here, it's like, yo, bro, all right, cool, let me drop you home. Let's go home. I'm going to drop you in the capital city, make it to your village. <laughs> how many of us are stuck? Stuck, you know? Like, and so it's one of them situations. It's like, so, boom, Right? So how do you feel about, um, I would say out of all of the countries, um, Nigeria and Ghana get the most shine, Ghana Mm -hmm. and I guess my thing is, and then I guess we can include South Africa as well. 
Mm-hmm. Even though they don't think they're Africans, but that's another conversation. <laughs> but I mean, what, what's your thoughts on that? You know, because to I be honest, there is a misconception, and I see just like here. You know, we see the tourist attraction, beach, mm-hmm. blue water, green water. I want to go, take me there, and I'm like, come on, y'all. To be honest with you, I'm kind of happy. I don't need y'all in my shit. Go to Ghana. Go wherever the fuck. Just you know, because like yo, I look at West Indian economies. And I look at the way in which like they bend backwards to accommodate to tourist dollars. And I don't want that to happen in my home society. Mm. It's not healthy. Like it's not healthy. You know, like look at places like Gambia, like sexual tourism capitals of the world. You know, look at places like Thailand, right? Like look at what happens when you dedicate your economy to the tourist dollar. Bro, it's not healthy for you as a people. And people don't know about like sex trafficking in North Africa. Ooh, but, India? Fam, put it to you like this, man. I'm from Cameroon. Mad people, before they go to France, end up in places like Tunisia and Morocco, etc. Mm-hmm. People don't know about the Africa brothers being forced into selling their ass in the Maghreb, in North Africa. Mm-hmm. Literally, like, men raping men. Like, yo, cuz, like, cuz, keep thinking it's games. Keep thinking it's sweet. Like, a lot of weird things are happening inside of that Sahara Desert that we're not speaking about. So I think, me personally, like, I think it's terrible. I, but, I mean, if you look at the, it's the same argument that African Americans have been making to African Americans, meaning hyper-visibility does not equal better treatment. It's the same thing with Nigeria and Ghana. The hyper-visibility that they're getting doesn't mean, like, better treatment. Yo, did they just get, like, the Nigerians just got banned from the Emirates. They can't even get certain visas for Dubai anymore because some Niger guys hit a lick. In Italy, if you're a Nigerian boy, you might as well just have like a star David. No, no disrespect to you know what I'm saying? But like it's a scarlet letter, right? Being Nigerian in Italy is a scarlet letter. You might as well just say to the world, I'm, you know, in France, being a sub-Saharan African boy, why would you? Right? So if you look at it, I just think personally speaking, our conditions aren't very aren't improving very much. And we really have to start. They have different conversations. You speak French. Yes, I do. Let me ask you a personal question. Are you in a mm-hmm. relationship right now? No. Oh, 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 yes, yes. I'm in a relationship. Me and the money? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I say that to say, um, you know, do you plan on or do you only date African women? Like, because then we, because I consider myself first generation and then mm-hmm. I, I get concerned for a couple of different reasons, like second, third generation. I see West Indians in the UK and I realize you must protect your culture. I believe in that. Right? Like when you looked at West Indians in the UK in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the men there, their thing was going strong. Their thing was going strong. They, like they produced mad scholars, mad music. They meant they changed their thing. But as their thing got strong, their thing got more popular. And instead of like, you know, they meant they used to have Saturday schools where they were teaching Pan-African history to their children. They meant their thing was strong, fam. Then their community stopped enforcing like, yo, fam, stick to your gang-gang type operation. And now there's more mixed race or children of mixed race Caribbean descendant that they are, you understand, like single Caribbean descendant situation. And I've seen what happened to their thing. For example, like the Nutton Hill Carnival, people think it's just a, no, it started because of police brutality. It was a response to police brutality. But the thing has been diluted so much when you go there now, it's a festival. But it's like, no, 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 no. This is a celebration of our existence that you're doing. And so my thing, having watching, having watched that happen to the West Indians, I realized, yo, bro, You've got to protect your thing. But this is where it gets interesting. So I used to tell my homeboy I only date African women in Africa. And he looked at me like, why? And I'm like, yo, because like back home, if you grew up back home, like there was, there's this song by this Ivorian group, um, Espoir de Mille, and they say, Mamadou Abineta is not Romeo and Juliet. Mm. What they mean by that is like, you know, like, yo, and so back home, the argument is a man's beauty is in his pocket. That's where a man's beauty is located. So it's like dating African women back home has its advantage because it's like they'll tell you straight. 
bro, like all of this love thing that people are talking to you about. No, 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 no. This is a business partnership. Can you meet my terms? What are your terms? Let's meet it. It's in the Western world that you're worried about things like love, Mm -hmm. right? And so like dating as Africans, because I'm not sure like, I'm not sure we can afford to love yet, right? People think I'm like, but I'm like, yo, bro, like, I don't think we can, you know, like if me and you, like, for example, I think a marriage is like a good partnership, Mm -hmm. right? So I don't think like, if me and you have a 50 year plan and you want to go out and catch a lover at year 26, I'm not going to trip. Right? Because it's like, we've got a 50 year plan. But if you grow up in a Western setting where like love is love and by going together, lover, you betrayed my love. So our thing is done. Your thing could well be done. And so that's why to me, it's a bit strange, but I only date black women. And so to go back to, I'm currently in a space where I've realized that I'm slightly jaded from dating. And the best thing I could do is sit my black ass to the side. Right? Like, is the is the best thing and the healthiest thing. So in the future, I would love for my wife to be African. So she could, you know what I'm saying? So we can teach our children our tribal languages and et cetera, et cetera. But you see, that's when it gets complicated. So, right? If we get in the in the crux of the conversation, so boom, like in that case, her being Cameroonian is not enough. She has to be either a or a window. And bro, like, fam, now you get to now you get to enter into like the elephant in the room of modern Africa, tribalism, right? The thing that nobody really wants to talk about, but it's kind of like, ah, yeah. maybe one day we should, you know? And so that's where it gets a bit complicated because, okay, I only know a window in its own, right? I would love to also know other like, quote unquote, African languages, but the infrastructure is lacking and et cetera, and et cetera, and et cetera. So then it becomes a, convers- a situation of it's like, so whose traditions will survive? Right, so let's say I marry an Awusa girl. Whose tradition will survive? Will my son be a Betty or will my son be an Awusa? Those are two different conceptions of the world and et cetera and et cetera, et cetera. Well, I guess, I mean, I was, I want to say I was taught, maybe I was told, but uh-huh. I would assume the man's tradition would survive. True, but my whole thing is, I think to be effective Africans, once you speak two to three African languages, right? So I would want my child to be able, because like, it's so sad to me, especially as a Cameroonian, that I know more about Europe than I can tell you about the extreme north of my country. It's truly sad. It's like, yo, bro, like, we don't know each other in truth, right? 60% of the Cameroonian population is Aousa Fulani. Yeah. If you want to talk about Cameroon and you don't know how the Aousa Fulani's behave, are you talking about Cameroon? You know, like, for example, like, if you've never had, like, bongocho beef, have you ever really had Cameroonian cuisine, right? But there's some people who just like, yo, that's them people's thing. And I'm like, I thought we were all the people. And then it's like, mm, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I was a man who told me one time that plantain stinks, right? Like, that's a staple. What are you talking about? For us, for that man there, that's some. <laughs> that man to eat plant. What the? What is a plant saying, my bro? <laughs> for a man who eats wheat, he, he eats wheat. You know, like, you, you be like my guy eats wheat and cow. You pull it up with plantain and smoke fish. He's looking at you like and green leaves. He's looking at you like, yo, son, whose man's is this? So. <laughs> It gets complicated. It does. It, it does get complicated. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm getting older. <laughs> I mean, and you're so, huh, my sister, you live in Houston now. Now, big money in Houston, huh? You will just get in vitro and all of these things and all of that. You will, huh? Uh, you will no, be- no, 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 no. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. No, but I mean, I, it's... That, that's a whole nother podcast. That's like episode three or four. <laughs> but, but um, no, I mean we kind of discussed it, but I definitely think about the second and the third generation, mm-hmm. um, and and just even my family structure is complicated in itself. So yeah, I mean, I just I pray that if I do have to have second and third generation outside of the homelands. 
they have enough of a connection to the homeland to where they can actually claim something. Yeah, that's my concern. And like, even my mom, she's like, I'm like, mom, do you want to go back? Do you want me to bury you back home? And she's like, no, bury me here so you can visit me. And I'm like, oh, okay. That's what, like, my friends look at me crazy, but I'm like, cuz, they're burying me back home. They're like, why? It's like, yo, cuz, you're gonna bury me on the land of my ancestors. What are you talking about, my bro? Like, like when she told me that, I was surprised. And like, and I got like I got the money to ship her. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly, it's like, well, maybe we don't have to make tortin for money now. Like, I go. <laughs> like, I'm gonna respect your wishes. Like, I'm gonna respect your wishes. Like, what we? What's the plan? Am I taking you home? Because you know we'll come together. But she was like, no. Like, you're here. And she's just like, bury me here. And I'm like. And I only went back home once when I was eight or nine, mm. you know? Mm. And unfortunately, so much of her family has passed away and, you know, mm. just the day-to-day mm-hmm. struggles. And it's, I don't know, it's, and my mom's getting older, so that trip ain't easier. Bro, that's, and that's what, bro, like, and the thing is, like, I give it up to the people nowadays who kind of go back and forth, mm-hmm. that they're a lot more common than they were 20 years ago. Like, there are people that do the six and six, six months here, six months back home. I give it up to them people because that's the lifestyle I'm trying to live. Because the truth is, like, if you don't go home often enough, you will lose it. Yeah. Like, even me that was born there, like, I remember I went back around, like, 2011, 2012, and that, that's what occurred to me. This was no longer home. Mm. Right? Like, I'm sitting in a place where it's like, yo, I'm home. Try to force the thing. Like, I'm home. What do you mean? But it's like, yo, my, my G. What you think, them little two months? Every year or two was enough to what? Yeah. Okay, cool. You more in the sauce than that. That foolish Negro, but you're still not in, you know what I'm saying? Not in the sauce. Like, bro, 10,000 TFAs ain't money for you. 10,000 TFAs is money for us, bro. Like, you know, like, you, and just that, just remembering that, bro, 10,000 TFAs is money. It's something that can be difficult to keep a track of because you spend a Benji in America, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you go to a restaurant, buy a bottle of wine, you know what I'm saying? And boom. Yeah. But you have spent close to like one third of somebody's monthly salary. And you can do that with the easy online business. You can do like one phone consultation a month. <laughs> And be, and be living lavish. <laughs> you know, that's the thing about it. Like, and the one thing is, the question about the second and third generations that I have is, are you sure crackers are going to let y'all stay? Because to me, Donald Trump is just a warning shot. Everybody thinks what, what Donald Trump is the last shot. To me, Donald Trump is the warning shot. Rick Santorum is still twerking somewhere in America. You understand? Mike Pence is still twerking somewhere in America. The Ted Cruz's of this world are still twerking somewhere in America, right? That that right wing white nationalist ideology is present in America. Where to Stephen Miller? You know what I'm saying? Like the old keepers are rolling around the street. Angry white guys are trying to tell us you will not replace us. And I think too often, as black people and as people of color, we don't listen to them. We think, oh, whatever, you dickheads aren't serious. But Bro, they gave us Trump. Like, Donald Trump is the U.S. president at the moment. The reality TV star that used to be on wrestling shows and that was on Home Alone, that guy is U.S. president. Because every white guy has decided, well, you guys, you you know what? I'm going to show you guys what... Listen, in places like Friends, they talk about denaturalization already. Right? There's right-wing ideology that's in charge in places like the Netherlands and et cetera, et cetera. What I'm saying to like black immigrants, especially this solid notion that you have that immigration is going to stay as it is. You might want to check on that because at the core of right wing ideology in the modern Western world, there's a reconquest of their lands. And I don't think they mean reconquest. Like I think they mean reconquest. Like, the question of truth was meant, mentioned a theory um, that's very popular in French, uh, in France right now called the Great Replacement. Mm-hmm. Why people feel like we're going to replace them and they're not going to go down on some friendly thing. Mm-hmm. So that's another thing a lot of us really have to think about because a lot of us immigrants didn't think Trump was going to get the first time in. Right? A lot of us are unwilling to believe that he can get a second time in. I believe he'll get it. I believe... 
I believe he can get it. And I think one pe- the electoral college is kind of complicated, so people don't understand that. Therefore, they forget about that. Right. Well, it's, it's not complicated. It's the framers of the system didn't believe that the masses, aka the poor people, were smart enough to make decisions. So they made sure there was a safeguard in case of the poor people made, you know, drastic decisions. Right. Right. And I, um, this perfect example, because I think um, my first election was presidential election was 2000. Mm-hmm. And Al Gore. One. And then Sue. Mm-hmm. Like, a, like a dickhead. Then Sue. Didn't finish Sue because it's like, oh, bipartisanship. Let's not break the country. Big man. <laughs> Big man. Big man. Gave us the damn Patriot Act. Silly guy. Like, my God, you could have sued him. We would have not been down with the Patriot Act. It may have not stopped 9-11, but the response post that would have been better, right? It wouldn't have been random Sikh guys getting murdered in the streets. It wouldn't have been like open racist and xenophobia in the American streets and American policy for the next eight years. It would have been the, like the destruction of civil liberties and things of that nature. But it's cool. You got a TV channel out of it, so I guess you made your bread and everybody got paid, right? The only thing that truly lost in that moment was the American democracy. But, you know, nobody really cares about that, man. No, 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 no. I'm curious to know with everything that you just said, um, mm-hmm. what's your take on reparations? So, um, CLR James is a Trinidadian author, and he's amongst one of the first people to write about the notion of reparations. I think if black people are smart, first of all, African Americans should not accept money as reparation. What I mean by that is it should not only be money, right? It's like, before you give me this lump sum of money, I need a lifetime of therapy, lifetime housing support, and et cetera, et cetera. Get your money's worth from America because after America does give you that one-time payment, the white folks go, boom, boom. So, ain't no more racism. We don't want to hear about all of that, right? And they're going to keep discriminating you. It's not like they're going to give you reparations and stop discriminating you. They're going to give you reparations and discriminate you harder because now they've given you reparations. So if you are at the negotiating table with the people there, get yours. Get all of yours. Don't play with them people. Don't think. They need to give you at least $10 trillion as a totality. They need, no, nah, bro, don't play with them people. Listen, this latest moment, uh, according to coronavirus, when they found $7 billion to print out a thing that let you know they got the money. They do always got the money. Don't let them tell you different. Find you 10 trillions for you and yours and go do your tactics. Number one. Number two, on the notion of reparations, I think every black person globally is entitled to reparation from some Western nation. In the case of me, for example, as a Cameroonian, I need the French state to run me my coins. Mm. Right? Okay. Like, the French state needs to run me my coins. I mean, forget the colonization of the fact that my grandfather fought in World War I and two for you fuck niggas and didn't get none enough. The birth certificate of my mother has a French Republic stamp. Mm. She was born four years before the independence. People, you owe me a check. You understand? But, so that's my whole thing about reparation. I think, for example, as Africans, we should not be trying to crowd like lineage Americans' reparations claim in America. We have to be audacious and bold and go demand that the French and the English government pay us back our coins, right? That's the thing. It's like, because the thing is, some African Americans are afraid that now that the money's here, some of us are going to come take their thing. And I understand their fear. And I don't even want to create that impression. So I think the best way for us to do as Africans is go down on the history list. It's like, who owes us money, right? Because America's, they, but yo, people owe us money as Africans and we need to start collecting, right? Like, what, that's first my thing. What about China taking over African countries? Man, listen, China ain't taking over nothing, right? What China is doing is, China is trying to play dangerous games. And the truth is like, if you let, a man come inside your house and take your children in front of you while you are watching. Is he taking or you like, you know, like, because that's the whole thing about like China taking over, China taking over. It's like, bro, like, those Chinese guys think they're slick, they think they're around, but they're not big, they're not bad, right? So it's like, they're lending money to these old guys that are going to die within five to ten years, and they think they're going to come collect from me. 
I'm going to tell them exactly like this, my guy, go collect to me and then hold me over there. That's not my concern. Right? Like, that's like, like this, you know? Like, and also, because people are worried about the Chinese, I'm also worried about, like, Press the button that controls the microphone. I'm also worried about, like, the Americans in Africa. My whole thing is, everybody's got to get out of my home. That's my thing. Is you want to send me home, tell me, oh, okay, give me my reparation check, and then you've got to get out. You understand it was there. Go talk to your French homeboys or something. Go visit Germany or something. Figure something out, right? And I don't think people are really ready for that conversation, right? I think people... The reparations conversation is bigger than African Americans. I'm not saying that African Americans don't deserve reparation from the American government. I'm saying every black person deserves reparation from somebody. Every black person who's a direct descendant or was affected by shadow slavery or colonization. And that's how we need to frame the reparations issue. I think we're, th we're still thinking too small. Guys are still just think about it. It's like, no, 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 no. Your blood and sweat and tears mixed onto the fabric of this whole global capitalism system. Get yours. Get your money, bro. Somebody owes you money, get your... For example, like, the Belgian guys, you've got to run Congo checks. Checks on checks on checks. You've got to run them run these guy checks. These French guys, you owe money, bro. You owe big money. Spanish guy, you owe big money. Portuguese guys, you owe money. Dutch guys, do you Netherlands guys that oh, what we do is smoke weed now? There's no 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 bro. You owe money. You owe money. You will pay. And that's how I say, oh, English guys. English, but you guys already know you owe money. We don't even you, us and the English, we know each other. One day, my friend, we will pay. You will pay or we will pay. One day and the other. Because I think. That is the one thing that I do want African people to be more like. It's like, demand what's yours. Take what's yours. Understand that. Bro, like, these things are owed to you. The debt was paid in blood. Come collect yours. Mm -hmm. Stop letting these people gaslight you. Like, oh, it was such a long time ago. Independence in Cameroon was in 1960. That's recent. Most of our parents are older than independence. Mm -hmm. So... 9-11, never forget. Right, right. Don't threaten on me, right. <laughs> don't threaten me with my little black face stuff, yes. Don't don't you threaten on me, oh, uh-uh. Run me my check. Run me my check. I want all of my check. All of my money. And once we do that, black people really need to start funds to really create and foster a sense of community because, once again, rest in peace to Tony. Rest in peace to Brianna Taylor. Rest in peace to the two trans ladies that were killed. I don't know your names. Like, I know your names, but I don't want to mispronounce them, and et cetera, et cetera. So, like, you know, I apologize for my shortcoming in that regard. You know what I'm saying? Say her name in real life because we need each other. But at the same time, like, we need resources to be there for one another because part of the reasons why we can't be in communities, we're too poor, we're trying to hustle and get on top of one another with the little crumbs, and the crumbs aren't satisfying us. The crumbs are destroying us. This hustling for the crumbs, you see where it's taking us. So, you know. Real. That's real. Man. Well, like, is there anything else? <laughs> uh, boom. Africa will be free. Protect black women. Protect black women. Protect black women. Africa will be free and protect black women. You know, black women are the future of blackness. Black women are the future of Africa. And Africa will be free. The ones that came before me. And to the ones that come after me, hopefully we make this thing a bit smoother for you and nobody has to call you a nigger in the street. Hey. And respect hey. black men. Okay. How can people... I mean, you know, I mean, love us. Love us, you know. Love, love us and protect us. Men. Love and protect us. You know what I'm saying? Like, respect is cool, but you know that shit's for the bread. I'll take love. You know what I'm saying? Like, really? Yeah. You think they're different? Man, listen. It's, it's not... The thing is, guys want to move like they're wolves in the jungle. And I'm like, we are human beings living in a society where violence is no longer a viable currency. So all of these big boy, tough guy arguments you're trying to make are obsolete, my guy. Like, we are living in Windows 10 and you're still talking Windows 95 talk. Nobody's here for that. Nobody's here for that, bro. Like, about respect. No, fam. Love me and, love me and understand me as a human being. Please. Like, man, what respect to my drill sergeant? Oh, 
black men. Love black men. Love black men. Especially this one. Hey, listen. <laughs> listen, my therapy is working, okay? All right, cool. So, boom. You can find me online at Man Like Blacks on uh, IG, on uh, Twitter. And, like, that doesn't mean that I like blacks. It's like, it's a UK slang thing. Blacks is my nickname. And, you know, Man Like Blacks. Um, the same thing on YouTube. Check out my podcast, Gary and Peanuts. Uh, you know, it's about Gary and Peanuts. It's not really about Gary and Peanuts, but you know, like, and if you get the joke about Gary and Peanuts, when you like it, let me know, because, you know, I'm, I need to know that somebody else appreciates this type of humor. Um, to the weird, fresh, fresh off the boat kids, stay weird. To the nerdy black kids, stay nerdy. To the tough black guy, go to therapy. Um, and that's that. Don't forget to call your mama today. Don't forget to hug your mom if you got one and she's still here with you. Yo, don't forget to show love because this life thing only happens once. Don't forget to be a human being. The world is trying to strip you that don't allow them to because it's not a life worth living. So what you think? Wasn't that a great episode? I know we covered a lot. Uh, once again, Manny Blacks is a real one. You are loved and respected, my brother, a force to be reckoned with. And y'all go support that brother, follow him online, listen to his podcast, Gary and Peanuts, uh, so you can get that knowledge. Yeah, man. So we wrapping up. I have a few things in store, so stay tuned. Remember, I believe in you. Personal connection leads to an influential network. Thanks for networking with Michelle.